Yeah, welcome to the first episode of African Do Post podcast. Um, this is the culmination of something that we've been working on for a long time, and it's great to have you with us as we launch it into the market. We are going to be having conversations about entrepreneurship from the unique lens of the African entrepreneur. And I hope to have guests who will excite you, teach you, uh, maybe cry, those who cry. Uh, and laugh for those who love to laugh. And we're looking forward to a very, very exciting story about the African entrepreneurial experience and also changing the views of narratives regarding the African entrepreneur. So thank you very much for joining us and welcome. Today I have with me my first guest. Yeah, <laughs> first guest is a, a very good friend and someone I really admire. And uh, she's called Marilyn Mudoni Kamuru. Um, I'll tell you, I have a name for her, but that name is not for, for these formal sessions. And um, let me start with why, who she is. So Marilyn is currently, um, she's a serial entrepreneur. She's a feminist. She's um, uh, an angel investor in, in, in several businesses and just an all round great person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But but why why I have called her specifically, and she doesn't think of it as a big accolade, but I think it is quite a unique accolade in this journey of entrepreneurship. Um, Marilyn has conceptualized a business, uh, brought it to life, uh, built it into something, and eventually sold it. And, and that is not many people who can say. Many of us have built businesses, closed them, or built businesses and uh, uh, walked away for them, for, for them for one reason or the other, but she's actually managed to sell it. And that journey sometimes is, is painted from a very, let me say, sexy perspective. You mm. know, it's meant to look like it was all... Uh, enjoyable and uh, yeah and then I how much money did you make and you know now are you going to enjoy and we just want to have an honest conversation about that so Marilyn welcome thank you yeah it's really good to be here so um I wouldn't even start by mentioning the business okay. but um I remember we were once talking about this and you told me the journey you're a lawyer by yes. training yeah um um Ivy League trained lawyer and um, just walk us through how did this start and, and how your company, the idea of your company uh, came about and how you launched it into what it became. Okay. Um, so as I was telling you, it's, it, I, I sold this business a couple of years, not a couple, actually um, going on five, six years ago. Um, so th th there's a lot of memories coming up. In fact, I was just thinking I should have gotten tissue. I should have made sure I have some here because... Some of these are just sub stories. Um, so I was living in the States at the time. Um, we moved to the um, to the U.S. when I was 16. Um, and actually, at the time I moved back to Kenya in 2005, I had lived the vast majority of my life outside of Kenya. Um, but I really wanted, I was working as a corporate lawyer and um, I had my son and I really wanted to come home. Um, I really wanted my son at the time um, to just to know Kenya and not know Kenya like, um, you know, summer holidays, safari and yeah. the beach, you know. Um, and and so I'd been thinking about how am I going to come home? What can I do? Um, and, you know, so th so that was in the back of my mind. It was percolating. It was, you know, just generally I want to do this, but I didn't have a path. Um, and so I'm in the States. I'm working. I'm in-house counsel. Um, for a company called Bright Horizons, which was um, a listed company on the um, NSC. And we were the first to do corporate child care solutions in the United States. Yeah. So um, it was a, a really interesting business, husband and wife founded, and it was very startup modish. Um, and I was a, a legal counsel, but I reported directly to the chief operations officer. Yeah. And during this time, I'm going to date myself here, um, we had the the whole Enron scandal yeah. and the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that came out. Um, and they started becoming this huge uh, focus around record keeping and retention of records in the event of litigation or um, fraud. <laughs> um, and I was tasked with that thankless task. 
you know, um, I was basically just told, oh, just, you know, figure this out and figure out how to keep the figure records. out how to uh, know how to make sure we were compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley now okay. as it's coming out. Okay. Um, so from a legal standpoint, figure out our compliance um, and make sure that, you know, you're sort of advising us generally to do this. It's a new thing. So it at the time, nobody really thought it was a big deal. Um, and so I started doing this. It was really exciting and very interesting. Um, it gave me lots of exposure to the board, to the the CEO and the CFO. And my my uh, boss, um, a guy called Steve Dreyer, best boss ever had. Um, and, and so when we started doing this, one of the things that um, we realized, because we were operating in multiple states, was we had state regulations and federal regulations for document retention. And then we had, because we were dealing with babies and children and um, the U.S. being such a litigious society, yeah. we had our own internal um, thinking about what the time frame we would want to retain records beyond the legally required time frame. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I was developing all of those policies, writing them up in the course of doing that. I discovered how we retain our records and we were retaining them in multiple facilities. Um, the leader in the business is a it, worldwide, I, I believe still is, is a company called Iron Mountain. Um, and the, the way this business works, because these are primarily paper records. And even when there were digital, there was still at the time a, a huge um, bias for paper records. Yeah, yeah. Um you know, so, so files, this, filing cabinets, files, and the filing huge, cabinets, yeah. you know, people didn't believe a thing until it was written, right? Even if we had computers, they wanted to print it out. Um, and then there were also a lot of things that are signed, you know, like a parental consent form, you know, um, my child own, is uh, allergic to nuts, there's a signature, you want to retain that form. Um, and so... In the course of doing this, I discovered how much money we were spending. And we discovered as a company how much money we were spending. And we were spending an enormous amount of money. Spending money keeping the records. Keeping the records. Okay. And the way the business model works is you rent out um, as... Okay, so for, for us as a company, we're just retaining records. The records are stored in boxes, in archiving boxes. Now we have archiving boxes. In fact, when I came to Kenya, there were no archiving boxes. I had to actually help the carton manufacturers create the archiving boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so these archiving boxes have uh, basically, let's just call it a square footage. Mm -hmm. But the billing for the company, the records management company, they bill you based on cubic footage. Okay. So they basically make money off air. Yes. Is what I like to say. Right. Mm. So we're billing you based on the cubic footage, um, but we pay for square footage because you re you lease a warehouse, you rent a warehouse and you're just paying for square footage. Um, and what happens with records is for the most part, people, once they give them to you, they never. So the company is basically paying a monthly or an annual fee yes. to basically store boxes. Yes. OK. And actually, it's a quarterly fee and it's quarterly in advance. Um, and then what, what the Sarbanes-Oxley Act um, now made mandatory was the retention period. Um, so one of the things that people wanted to make sure was you definitely had the records retained and you could prove that you had been retaining them. Okay. So it even, God forbid, something happened to it um, and you weren't able to produce the records, you would have um, a policy and a practice that would basically be your defense in court. Um, and so we're spending an enormous amount of money. And when I looked at it, we weren't going to be able to mitigate any of that cost okay. um, because we needed to retain these records. In fact, in some cases, um, we weren't tracking how long we were retaining them and we wanted to retain them longer. Um, and so my job then was to rationalize this, um, this supplier relationship across the various states, try and reduce um, our expenditure if we could, and then just create policies around it. And in the course of doing this, I, of course, learned an enormous amount about this business. And it was to me, a ridiculously easy business. Um, like but, all things seem. Yeah, the, and, <laughs> and it was super profitable because yeah. we're paid quarterly in advance. Um, you know, you could get a, a discount if you're doing annually in advance. You have what's called a termination fee. So if you want to leave, you have to pay to sort of exit the contract. Um, and for the most part, you have to retain the records for legal, regulatory, tax, or some mm -hmm, other purpose. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you want to keep them. Um, and the the warehouses, once you got the warehouse, you essentially were just, the moment you'd covered your um, operating expenses, 
the based on your square footage was usually just like two boxes deep and you could often go 60, 80 high. Okay. So great, great model. Um, and Kenya was super paper intensive, right? Yeah. Um, and even though I'd been gone, um, you know, as I've said, uh, a really long time since I was 16, I used to come back almost every other year, every three years. Um, so I, I was still sort of familiar with Kenya and I, I thought of Kenya as home. Um, I was soon to learn Kenyans didn't think of me as Kenyan, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I'm going home. So I, I, thought about this business um and i decided i'm gonna so from your learning of of this statutory storing of records in the states that's driven by a legal requirement yep. you say there are there are equal legal requirements in kenya to store documents like i know for publicly traded companies it's yes. five years and uh, for tax purposes it's also five years yep. uh, so you said okay there's a yes. business model here mm -hmm. and now you decide i'm off we're moving Okay. We're moving. Um, so I quit my job. Um, I still remember my uh, my boss, my the COO, just asking me. I mean, you're. I mean, obviously they they're like Africa. You're going to Africa, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm just I'm gonna give this a shot. Um, and I think I should also say one thing. When I um when I graduated from law school, by the time I graduated from law school, um, we were in the you know the dot com boom. Mm -hmm. Um, and then soon after, about two and a half years after that, we had the crash, the dot com crash. Yeah. Um, and I had this six figure corporate um, associate job. Actually, I'd wanted to be a human rights lawyer, but, you know, they didn't really hire Africans to do that work at the time. <laughs> so I was like, let me make money. Um, and and then we had the crash and I lost my job. And for me, one of the things that was really helpful about losing my job is I was like, hmm. It doesn't matter how good I am at yep. what I do. Yep. Um, the only person I can count on is me. True. You know, so I I, I really feel like losing my job. I, I'd had, um, when I was in law school, I'd started a, a, a business called Kenya Law. We were transcribing and digitizing um, legal cases because at the time, Kenya wasn't reporting. And because we're a common law jurisdiction, you need precedent to go to court. Okay. So we started digitizing these cases. Um, and we had a model, we were going to sell them. And then we fell out with um, my partner at the time um, and and she went on to do it. But um, I, I, I had an interest in business, but being laid off really um, made me understand. Was, what, was the last push you needed to? I, I don't know even sure it if that? it was a push. What I would say is that what it made me understand is it doesn't matter wherever I'm employed. Yeah. Um, the only person I can count on is me because they could let go of me regardless of how good I am at my job. True. And I was very good at my job. Um, and I think the other thing that it made me realize is I, I'm not ever going to get attached to a job, right? Or even a business. So I'm not one of those people who called my business my baby. I always kept telling people this is a business. I'm growing it. And, and I intentionally planned on selling it. Um, because again, that's the way the the business grows um, on on an international, even nationally. Um, businesses grow by acquisition. So you you grow a business, it gets to a tidy sum, and a bigger player comes and just swallows you up because they just buy your clients and they buy your long term contracts. So so from the beginning, and, from and maybe the beginning. maybe now it's a time to introduce e manage Africa. <laughs> so you come beginning. back home, and yes. e manage Africa is born. Yes. And uh, for those of you who don't know eManage Africa, it's still a company in operation. Yeah. And it is the first. Am I right in saying that? Well, was it the yeah, first? It was about the first. Um, we we were the first. Yes, we were the first indigenous um record storage business, document storage company in yeah. in the market. And yeah. you you then now now here you are. Welcome yes. to you've come to Africa, come and to then, Africa. and then now you you have to. I've liquidated my four hundred one k. Yeah. I've packed up my entire house um, and so I have... So 401k is a, is a Kenyan equivalent of a pension. Yes, you, you it's my retirement. Your retirement yes. fund, yeah? Yeah, so all my savings, my 401k, I mean, this was the, it was a do or die. Yeah. Um, um, although the, the framing I gave myself was, I'm here, if it doesn't work out, I can always move back. 
Um, yep. And that's just what I told myself. And I, because I hate feeling boxed in. Yes. So that's what I told myself. But I basically cut all ties. I mean, I left my nice... Um, Cold turkey. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, we packed up the house, put it in. Um, my, I, I moved here with my son uh, first and um, my then husband was left ra- wrapping things up and he was going to follow us. Okay. And I moved in with my parents because... You know, I had to come find a house, which is why I was coming first. Um, so moved in with my parents, um, didn't have a car, had to get a car, didn't, had left my nice, you know, Land Rover and was driving some silly Toyota here that was electric blue and just, oh my God, that car made me want to cry. <laughs> so you're here. You know, yeah. You're here and what do you... How do you start? You know, where where do you start when you want to start a business like this? It's a new idea. You have no one to look to and 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 uh, emulate and say, okay, so where do you start? You know what to do, um, but I, I think, would assume you're looking for space or what are you looking yes. for? Yes. I mean, I had a business plan. So okay. one of the, um, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but one of the things I did is I really over-prepared for this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had a business plan. I had five-year projections. I mean... Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. And You're going to make the I money. I was going to make the money. I was going to sell this business in six years, I think I'd said on the outside. And it was going to be regional. And, you know, um, and I wanted fuck you money. <laughs> and I felt like it was possible. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. And so I come here and it took me, I think, four months to register my business. And those were the days. Yeah. There was no. Uh, just to register my business, you know. Um, and you're eating your own cash that I'm, time. You're I, earning nothing. Oh, no, I, and and it was really expensive. This is the other thing that I think um, sometimes we don't really understand. Kenya is really expensive, even at the time. Yeah. I was like, wait a second, this place, it's like I'm in Boston. I mean, it really, I, I didn't, you know, there's a way we think about it. Um, and now that I've lived here, I'm sort of like, yeah, this is what, you know, it costs to live here, but it's kind of expensive to live in Nairobi. Um, so I'm going through this cash. I'm watching it dwindle. And I know I don't really have money. And the business hasn't opened. Else. You haven't started. No, yeah. No. My dad is really upset with me because he's like, you have a great law degree and you're just quitting. And you had a great job. You and know, I had a great, great job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, perfect career path. And then you're just over here to come and do what? In you my know? house, eating my food. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he was not happy. He was not happy. In fact, he was so unhappy that... Um, he convinced me to try and go to Kenya School of Law and at least um, Regularize, get admitted yeah, to so the bar here. So that you can here. be yes. admitted to the bar, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I went and they told me, yeah, you need to do three years. Um, and I'm like, I, I have an undergrad degree. I have a JD and a master's. And they're like, yeah, yeah you still need to do three years um, if you want to. So I didn't know Nibeya Kuangea. I didn't know you should have had a conversation yeah. around that. You have been so, told, you're yeah, passing the message, yes. the message is not landing. Yeah, I, I was. I got nothing, which was really the first couple of years of being here, right? Mm. Um, you go there, even registration, it took me that long because you give me the process and I'm like, okay, so these are the documents you need. So I come back with the documents you need. And then I'm wondering why you're not moving. So where are we? What year is this when this you're doing 2005. this? 2005. I arrive in 2005, November. I actually didn't even stay for Thanksgiving. Um, 2006, my business is registered. So when do you open doors? Now you're now... 2006, I opened doors. 2006. Yes. And then um, what do you do? I found, a, I found a facility in industrial area. Um, some... It's a go-down or what is it? Yes, a go-down. Mm-hmm. Some nice Italian guy, uh, Giorgio, rented um, a small go-down to me. Um, and, and you know, that was that was really helpful because I, I was speaking to businesses, but without a space, nobody could really... You know, mm-hmm. um, nobody was willing to to entertain the idea. But I think the other thing that I discovered during that time was I'd, I'd obviously tell them how I'm a lawyer, as I thought that, you know, it was building trust and you credibility know, yeah. and credibility. And they were just like, why aren't you practicing law? I, yeah, where you come into pack yes, documents in yes. boxes. Yeah. Um, there's a real, and I think we're not honest enough about this in Kenya. People really look down on entrepreneurs. Yeah. Until you've made enormous amounts of money or the story other people, is sexy, but yes. but otherwise they think you're otherwise they just think, you know, you're an entrepreneur because you couldn't do anything else. 
you it's know. so interesting you say that because my journey is the same. My yeah. dad's reaction is almost identical to yours. You know, mm-hmm. he's looking at me and saying, you want to do what? You, you, why? Why? You know, <laughs> you're on this track yes. and you're going to become yes. this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So you have now opened. Italian guy has rented you a go down. Rented me a go down. It's a small space. I kid it out. Um, there's no shelving. So I have to build the shelving mm-hmm. with a supplier. Um, I mean, I just, I had to do a lot of things myself, right? So we do the shelving. I have to do the measurements. There are no archiving, standard archiving boxes. So I develop a standard archiving box that you we're using. To, yeah. And, um, and that's what they're, they're, um, they're making for me. They, they have the die cast. They charge me for all of that. And then now I'm in the market trying to sell so my So you're services. now knocking at doors. Yes. But you're selling people something that they've never used before. No. So they've yeah. never had, and so they don't know that they need, but yes. you're telling them that, listen, you guys need this thing. Yeah. And how does that pitch look like? Um, so before I tell you that, let me just tell you that at the time, you could be in on Mombasa Road, and actually I lived... Um, I lived um, up Langata Road. We could call it Karen, but really, not really, but mm. whatever. <laughs> um, so, and I was working in an industrial area, so I'd be on Mombasa Road. You could buy Jugu Karanga that were wrapped in um, bank statements at the time. Okay. That's that's where the records that's were. where yeah, the yeah. records were. The, 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 the white and green ones. Yes. Remember those? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, from the dirt So you can printer. even see somebody's name and, you know, those details were already there. So we didn't really have an... Um, any respect for the privacy. We we were really, I'm sure those documents had been released for um, for destruction, but they weren't being destroyed. They yes. were being recycled. The paper has value. Yeah, yes. yeah. They were being recycled. Um, so I go to banks. I started with banks. And um, in the interest of honesty, because that's what we're trying to do on, on this podcast, that's what my, my brief was. Yeah. Um, I had um, some contacts. An aunt of mine um, uh, had... Uh, some shareholding um, with this uh, bank and um, we knew one of the directors. So I got a meeting with- So she sent you through pass. She sent me, yeah. yes. Um, but no, that CEO- Not that job. You no. know, you're, you're being and, sent and I'm to still, pitch yes, your pitch. I'm still yeah. pitching. And so luckily enough, I pitch. I find um, that they're in the process of, of uh, moving um, their, um, their records and I find a fairly um, open uh, person. And so we had this discussion and uh, they'd had experience in South Africa. And they're like, oh, yeah, I understand this business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this makes sense. We can do this. And, and so uh, I think it took, what, uh, maybe six months? No, four months. And then I got my first boxes. Mm-hmm. And the first client was critical because, again, you're doing proof of concept all this time. So your first right? uh, 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 client is a local bank. Is uh, not a local bank. <laughs> but it's a bank. <laughs> but it's a bank. In the yes. country. That in trades the country, in the country. Yes, that okay. trades in the country, but yeah. not a local bank. That, that was another thing that I learned was that local banks were the most risk averse and the least trusting of, it seemed to me. Local entrepreneurs. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You knew exactly what I was going to say. I knew where you're going, man. <laughs> I know that yeah, word well. You know that yeah. story. Yeah. You know that story. Yeah. yeah, they were the worst. They were the worst. And and the most extractive. So um, there's a bank that shall not be named that um, basically um, had us do a consulting um, engagement to identify the scope of the work. Should we get the work so that they could, you know, basically um, tender for the work. Yeah. And I still remember they paid us 100K. That work cost more than 100K, but I was, you know, optimistic. You're pitching. And I'm After pitching. this, I'll do the work. Yeah. And, then all and, be and well. I'm good. And I've met the CEO and they sounded positive. And, you know, I've sold them this story about coming back. And, you know, also the other thing was people really just expected me to fail. Um, and it, some of them said it. Other people just were like waiting me out. Maju. Yeah. She'll yeah. come. She'll How do her he? thing. She How can't. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and then, you know, my accent was really strong. I was used to doing things extremely properly. So, you know, you suggest something book. to me and I'd be like, no, 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 no. We don't do that. You mm. know? And so everyone would just kind of roll their eyes and like, yeah, she's not going to last. Um, so we do this job and then they turned around and they hired somebody in-house to replicate what 
we were so doing. the consultancy that you are doing which yeah. you are paying 100k you are paid 100k yeah which Mr. i went at a loss yeah. to do local yes. bank yep. comes and yeah. doesn't give you the work to do takes nope. your idea yes. and gives your paper to an in-house guy yep. and says set hire. this up like this they, they hire, hire. They an hire in-house an guy. in-house guy. Welcome to and Kenya. Yeah. Yes. And then a few years after that, they give the business to someone who's related to one of the, you know, top executives. So those challenges notwithstanding, you've now, you've gotten your first client. I've gotten my first client. And uh, are you, they're how are you, are you making ends meet? Uh, is um, what they're paying? Are you paying the rent? Are you? Yes. I'm paying yeah. rent. I'm paying salaries. Um, yeah. Where in that your staff? Order, How many people do you have um, on board at this time? Oh, gosh. Maybe about like four people. So one of the other things that I discovered with staff was, so everyone says labor is cheap here. I actually had the worst luck initially with university graduates. Okay. Um, they were very difficult to teach. They were very entitled. Um, and they hated working for a small business. Okay. So they they were actually, they resented the fact that they were there. They thought they were better than this business. Yeah, yeah. who are you? Yeah, me and meanwhile, I'm like, some... this is my whole life, man. Yeah. You know, I need people who are as hungry as I am. And so I started hiring people who had uh, way fewer credentials, but just had passion. The right attitude, yeah. Um, and like my operations manager, um, her name is Grace Karaoke, uh, and who... I we left with, she actually eventually um, moved on before I sold the business. Um, And Grace um, started off helping me with everything from the archiving. So she'd done a certificate in archiving. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she was helping me with the archiving and she understood that, but she would deliver proposals. She would help with the cleaning. I mean, I would clean too. Um, I, I drove our truck and I did deliveries. And so I would do everything. And and my expectation was, again, maybe a little too much so of are American you, are you attitude. Doing, are you doing any digitizing of the records? No, because You're initially, just storing them. You're just taking them, them from where the bank stores them? Yes. And you're putting them in yes. another place. Yeah. The banks will all tell you they want to digitize, right? Yeah. And they all told us they wanted to digitize. But first of all, you only digitize what you know you have. Okay. And they didn't, most of them didn't know what they had. Mm -hmm. So you would walk them through, this is how you do digitization as a process. And they'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, it was sexy and it was, um, my, my, my sense of our market is we love sexy stuff. We love the new sexy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we spin. talk a great game. Yeah. But the actual doing, we're not really great early No adopters. one wants to put in the work. Nope. Yeah. Nope. 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 Um, and and then I wasn't. I I I never gave a bribe. I never gave a kickback. I mean, I, and I I say this in all honesty. If I had to do it over again, you I would do it differently. You would. You would give I'm a little sorry. war chest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I would. I would. I mean, you know, people would ask me, Yanni, you actually got that business. I would, I would pitch you for work. You would go and pitch your pitch. I would. Yeah. And then I'd really follow up, you know? So I think sometimes people are just like, man, maybe, maybe she'll manage. But then now payments would be very slow. Yeah. Um, and I was horrible with payments because following I... Following up. Uh, no, I was great at following up. Yeah. But I was... And I learned the hard way that, you know, it's really bad when you're the owner of a business. And of course, you do have to do collections because at the time you don't really have a professional enough person mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to follow up with, mm-hmm. you know, like um, one of the big accounting firms. So you you want to maintain that image. But it's really bad when you're the person who is the owner of the business and having to do collections as well. Because, you know, to do collections, you need to be a little ruthless. But then you can't then turn around and be the person who's like, so we really appreciate your business. Yeah. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, you're sending, you're yes. on the verge of sending the auctioneers. You're to, like, you know. Give me my check. Yes. Yeah. And and um, I, I'm going to say this now because I can. There's a really bad culture in this country where I believe um, larger corporations and government um, are being fi- not just bullies, but they're being financed by small and medium sized enterprises. Agreed. Because they're not paying on time. Yeah. So what I'm doing with my small business is you've got my money for three months when you should have been paying me every 30 days. So essentially we're financing them. 
exactly. then they have these great profits and people wonder, how come you're not making, we're not making money because we're financing those guys to make their, you know, amazing profits. So you're in, you're in essence a shareholder, you know? Yes. Because you're, you're financing the a business. Very, yes. And then the other side of that coin is there are others who are also being financed by their staff. Yes. You know, because they don't pay They're overtime. They're not paying on time. They, yeah. Yes. So, and so okay. what, that was one of my big commitments. I, I always paid my staff on time. And um, Jojo was a fantastic landlord in terms of being accommodating, but he would need to be holding a check. Yeah. He, he was like, listen, I understand you're a small business, I, he, but he, I need to be holding the, the money. Yeah, yeah. I need to be holding so the now, check. So we're, now, we're, we're, we've now gone 2006. Let's yeah. fast forward because you ran eManage for 12 years. I think it's yeah. about 12 years. Yes. So yes. now let's fast forward to around 2010, 2012. Where are we now? So now we have... Um, How this... big is your team? Uh, are you in the same space? Has, have We've you We've got grown? a bigger space. Um, my team has grown. I One of the things that um, we did phenomenally well as a company is um, we trained our people. I, yeah. I um, As I told you, I started hiring people with a lot less experience. Um, and, and just investing in training and, um, building a company culture that was very responsive. And, and so even as we started to get competitors in the market, um, people would come to e-manage for the staff. So I ended up sort Instead of poaching your people. Yes. Banks, uh, our clients are poaching. I mean, and, and my approach was, you know what? I can't pay you that much. It's okay. Go grow. You know, um, but remember how you got to be here. And if you can give us business, it would be if great. You see, you work for us there. Yeah. And, but that's and, very interesting because that's not very common. Yes. Of the, growing people. And yeah. um, My staff I, I, I actually me. have a bit of a, a different experience because I feel that we do have some owners who feel that the staff owe them. You know, mm, because I you got you them. when you're nothing. Yes. And yes. now, so what yeah. are you doing? Leaving. Yeah. But anyway, how many are you? You started, you are four. So now we're about maybe like 10, 15 permanent. And then we are you're constantly taking on casuals for big projects, right? Is it still the, just the storage or is there it's still any just has the storage the business because moved in any way? We have, we have. So digitization has grown in the market, but what's happening is the guys who are doing digitization are, um, for the most part, they're getting a cut. You know, the, the exchange is if you're doing maybe, let's say, 10 shillings per page, um, like four of that is going to somebody. To some guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I wasn't doing that. But one of the things we had done is we basically were preparing clients for digitization mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. Without an organized um, set of physical records, you were unable to proceed to digitization. Um, so, so we by were bringing not... them into your, you yes. brought some order to the yep. way their documents are stored. You know what you have. Yes. And then we're helping you... them with policies okay. so that they're okay. now refining their policies. Um, in some cases, we're actually managing in-house um, for some clients. Um, so we were creating the the whole back end that allowed them to move into digitization. But again, um, you know, being naive, um, I was unwilling to do the things that digitization required. Mm -hmm. um, but it started to grow really fast as a business yeah. um, around us. How is your client base at this time? My client base is solid, um, really good companies. I'm picking up a lot of, uh, I'm picking up clients from uh, some competitors. Competitors co have come. Um, and mostly because of our service delivery, like our service was exceptional. We were, we, and I believe eManage still is. In fact, um, I, I did some work with them recently and I, I saw the form and I'm like, I developed this form. This is my form. You know, they haven't changed some of that stuff. Um, we were really good at service delivery and, and customer service um, because I understood very clearly that every, every client, and I used to tell my team, once we get the client, they're ours to lose. It's, if we lose them, we screwed up. So our job is as much as possible not to screw up. If they start to push us on price and it's just not tenable, we're happy to lose them. And again, that's one of the things I, I learned a lot later was actually I'm happy to lose certain types of clients. Yeah. Um, you get to, in the beginning, you want everybody Where for Where did that knowledge cost. come from? Because it's not easy Painful to make lessons. that call or you, 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 
uh, of course, you you talked about your local bank. Yeah. Uh, so stuff like that. Where you're saying, stuff okay. like that. And then, you know, banks coming and they're declaring fantastic profits and then coming when it's time to renegotiate a contract and they want to push you down on price. And you're like, this is really not reasonable, you know? So it, it, it was some of that understanding about the, um, just the, the, the market, but also, um, the context in which I was operating. I was also very active in the policy space. So at this point I was starting to really understand, um, this is how it functions. And, you know, this is just not, I, I'm here to make a profit. Like I was n under no illusions about that. So either you're growing, um, we haven't entered your, your sector. So there's a value to getting you and I might make concessions for you as a new client. Yeah. Or you're, um, you know, a blue chip, you know, one of the top, let's say top five companies in the country. I'm doing that, which was a really stupid business model now that I think about it. But um, I did it at the time. And and they're the worst, by the way. The biggest companies demand um, the most concessions from small businesses, which makes absolutely no sense. And I think it's one of the things we've talked about with you, Blanco, which is super important, is entrepreneurs need to understand that a lot of this has very little to do with them. When you're there wondering, why is my business not doing well? Yeah. Why am I not yeah. making this much money? Don't personalize Don't it. Don't personalize it. There is a culture here that is so extractive that, you know, somebody's at the absolute apex of this ecosystem and they're trying to just squeeze blood out of the stone that is an SME, you know, there, there isn't an understanding that there is an entrepreneurship ecosystem. So let, let me segue off that. And, and, and we are at 2012, you're now an established business, you have customer service standards, but let's speak a bit about the emotion of it, mm -hmm. you know? So you, you, you've done your, your six to seven years. Yeah. And I don't know. I think it's it's the hidden side of entrepreneurship. Yeah. The emotional roller coaster, the tool on personal relationships, yes. even as it's starting to look sexy. Because I'm sure by this time, yes. people are saying, hey, e manage Africa. Maybe you have some ads on the radio or, you what? know. Nothing, no ads, no. but maybe you have an identity. Yes. You know, when you yes. give we your, have an identity. you have a brand, when yes. you give your card, guys yeah. are like, hmm, yes. what's this? And what yes. do you do? And they're like, yeah. and yeah, I say, maybe, what do you call yourself? Oh, what? now founder, CEO. CEO. Oh. So there you are. Yeah. Oh, CEO, yeah, yeah. <laughs> CEO without a CEO salary. But yeah, yeah of course, CEO. <laughs> but yeah, you have the yeah. props. Yeah? Yes. Um, but, but maybe speak a bit about your... Exhausting. Yeah? I mean, really exhausting. As I said, I, I really... A lot of um, disrespect. <laughs> um, so you show up in spaces. Um, I, you know, I was an entrepreneur with my legal background, having done a lot of mergers and acquisitions, you know. Um, you know, in some cases, I, I mean, I've done deals of almost a billion dollars in some cases. So I had that entire background. You know. So you when know I space, speak, yeah, 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 when I speak in... Uh, a uh, policy space or a private sector meeting, and people are just like, "But what do you Who are run? You? Yeah, Who yeah. are you? Who are you? You know." Um, so really frustrating. Um, and I was very interested in policy because I actually, I, I guess, also because of my background, I understood that some of it the impediments policy. were policy. Yeah. yeah. So if my taxes have to be remitted by a certain time, but you guys, your withholding tax process is delaying me again. I'm oh, loaning no, you there's money. There's no recourse for a big corporate delaying the no. payment. For... And there's no understanding even that yeah. that's generally what happens. Like yeah. that's the practice, not the exception, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th there was, there was for me, a real frustration with the policy space, um, an inability to really influence it um, based on rational argument. <laughs> um, do, do, do you think, would, would, would you agree with me if I say it that um, in a lot of cases, particularly to do with SME, mm -hmm. the policy is not complementary, but the businesses thrive in spite of yes. the policy, not because of. Not because is of. That, is yes. that a fair comment? Yes. In your and experience? It, it is a very fair comment. And I do want to say on this, um, and I've told you this before, Ken Jaroge of Cellular, I remember... <laughs> Once going to him and I'm saying, Ken, man, if you joined us doing this, we're doing some advocacy. 
um, around uh, local content requirements. Yeah. And Ken just told me, don't waste your time there. Like, Point spend blank. your energy in, in a very somewhere Ken else. Way. Yeah, there was no... There's no upside to this conversation. It was like, this is not going to happen. And I didn't listen. <laughs> and you went. I should have listened. Yeah? Um, but I also learned lots of lessons from doing that. And then actually from, from doing that work, I... I um, ended up being an advisor to the cabinet secretary on um, the access to government procurement opportunities program. So, I mean, there, there was an upside, but not an upside for my business. And I was looking for an upside for my business, okay. right? Um, so it was a really frustrating and exhausting time. Um, uh, I was lucky to have, my parents were were quite supportive. My, my, my dad had died by that point, but before he died, he was super, super supportive. I used to go shopping. Proud, I hope. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, he he got proud because I think he also he was surprised. Yeah. Yes. He saw, he the, saw fight, the fight. Yeah. He saw the fight and he saw um that I could have fallen back on my degree, could have fallen back to the states and I just, you know, I was like no, actually I can make this work. So he work. watched you build something. He did watch me build nice. something. Um and 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 I could see that he was also impressed that I could make the shifts not very fast but could make the shifts that were necessary to operate in Kenya. Um, I used to shop at their house. I always tell people that, you know, you would I'd, go I'd, there to pick I'd things. Need groceries. I'd be like, man, I've got to pay salaries. So, and so, I need money for uh, gas. I so, need some, let me yeah. take some ungas here and yeah, a few other things. You know, um, and then my son, you know, uh, Maliki, my eldest son, because he had come from the States, he only ate orange oranges. And yeah, you know, he didn't see these green things. Those are not oranges. And you know, orange oranges are imported. Yeah. I used to buy like three man and I'm like, nobody eat the These child's oranges, yeah. you know, because we can't do that, you know? And then he, you know, he had this American taste. He liked cheese. And I'm like, dude, once a month we're doing cheese, you know? So, I mean, it was, and it sounds like a small thing, but you know, when you're having to change your entire lifestyle for a business, it is. I think one of the things that is not discussed and you've brought it out is the assumption is that while your business is growing, your broke. personal life is on hold. And it's not. It's not. Your kids are growing. Yes. You know, they're going to school. Expenses. Yeah. Yep. You're alone. Yep. You, you, you have some challenges. You want to buy some things you can't afford. Yep. Um, there's no understanding. You have this big name and title. Yep. But you don't have the money to boot. But now let's go or to... Or the car. Or the car. <laughs> Yeah, let's go to now you. You sold. And I think I I, I, and I and I celebrate that about you. I know it was not um actually the other day when you told me uh, after you sold you you had tears in your oh, eyes. Oh man. And, yeah. and and I thought about I uh, actually when I read uh, the Richard Branson book early mm -hmm. uh, in my, in my career same same thing when he sold Virgin Records. He Guys were saying he's a multimillionaire and he's running through the streets of London in tears. <laughs> so I got that yeah. image of you. So what happened? Why did you sell? Why did you feel the need to sell? Your business had settled. I knew I was going to sell. Uh, one of the reasons I, I felt that I needed to sell was I wasn't able. So I financed this business. On your own. On my own. Um, you know, uh, I had minority partners, but, you know, they weren't, you know, infusing cash into the business. And they the were business. not day-to-day, -day, yeah. And they were not day-to-day. -day. I was running the business entirely. And and so we were, you know, just plowing our money back into the business, right? Um, and I would do some consulting and I'd plow my consulting money back in here. Yeah. Um, this was my big So even bet. though you're running your business, you have like a side hustle. I, I had a side hustle because also at a certain point, you're just like, man, my kid's in private school. I can't take the amount of money I need to take. So, you know, um, and I, I knew, I always knew I would sell. And around this time, the leader in the world, Iron Mountain, reach out to me. And Iron like, Mountain. Iron Mountain, the guys number who one you are, in the world. Uh, who are, who yes. are, you who are like, had met in the yes. States. Yeah. And the guys who I knew I wanted to sell to. So yeah. the VP um, of uh, International reaches out. We have a discussion. Um, they suggest a meeting, um, and they suggest the meeting in Paris. Huh? Good. Let's yeah, go to right? Paris. Yeah. So me, I was like, we're going to Paris. And we went to Paris with my, I was like, Yanni, we're going with my kids and, um, my husband at the time. So we Are went to Paris for this meeting. Paris? No, they're not. So you're flying to Paris on your dime? On my dime. Yeah. Uh, and I talked to this guy and I realized this guy was not going to buy us. 
What was he doing? He was scoping out the Africa market. Aha. Uh -huh. So you have pop, popped up on some radar. We popped this, up on this their radar. This is what is happening yes. in this part of um, the world. Because I was doing, uh, I was doing industry conferences, especially in the United States, and I was sending my staff when I could yeah. um, to these conferences, and so we popped up. Um, and I think maybe uh, six months to a year after that meeting, um, there was a spinoff of uh, this. You know, I. I, I it was essentially a spin-off with um, the vice president as one of the interested parties where they were acquiring businesses in Africa. Mm -hmm. So again, you, you, you find that we're in this market and no one actually even gives us the respect that they would in another market, which is come here, acquire a business that's been built by a local. Yeah. It's then let's create a middle company, you know, that is going to do that acquisition which means that really what they're trying to do is make sure that the value extracted, the full value extracted when you sell to an Iron Mountain is not going to be retained. So the, yeah, so someone else. Someone else and I've seen that. that. I've seen that yeah. in, uh, actually, I know of, um, um, I know of something that happened like that in the oil marketing space mm -hmm. where some people came to do some work an acquisition, local acquisition didn't work out. Yes. But then they set up because of access to capital. Yes. Which they we set out, which yes. we don't have. Yeah. So they set up something and that yes. something started building something else. And in three, yeah. four years, you'll hear that thing being sold on yes. for a fair penny. Yeah. And in addition to access to capital, yeah. because of the narratives around who are African entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. So there is um and, and there is a deliberate intentional flattening of who we are and our capacity and capability. One of the things that you like to talk about a lot, and and I really I've understood it very differently since speaking to you is the value of our knowledge, yep. which is sort of, you know, diminished and poo-pooed. But in actual fact, it's the thing that no one really wants you to put on the table, because if you put that on the table, they can't take you off. I always ask guys to do this exercise. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Any media, uh, particularly now LinkedIn is the most, uh, but any commercial media, Google Africa expert. And uh, look and see yes. how and many see, of them yep. are Africans. Yes. And then and then on the same note, go and uh, you know a lot of Kenyans in the diaspora, mm -hmm. Africans in the diaspora. How many of them can get away touting themselves as European? Or you could tout yourself as an American expert. I know you've lived the life. Yes. You've been yes. to the schools. You're there since you're 16. You've studied in the unis and all that. Yeah. But no one will allow you no. to position yourself as an African expert. And they won't pay me. Yeah. It's not a comparable thing, right? Mm. There, there's no real value attached to that, yeah. you know? Um, and, and so I think, you know, one of the things that for me was really interesting about doing this podcast, and I think it's really important, is that we really need to start having narratives of ourselves. Yeah, by that, ourselves. By ourselves. Um, and, and that really place an enormous amount of value on the knowledge that we have around maneuvering our own systems. Lack of cash notwithstanding. Lack of cash notwithstanding, yeah. you know, because the cash is going to come. And to be very honest, I've seen people with cash in this market. You know, I like I, you and I talk about this all the time. We see a business and we're like, they have too much money because you know what it's like to operate when you don't have cash, right? Yeah. And I know in the beginning, it really seems like cash is huge, huge, huge. The bigger thing is, is there a clarity of vision? Is there a real business value and business proposition? Is the timing right? Because sometimes I liked what you're just you said when you said time. when you said you will sell your business in six years, even though you sold it around year twelve. Yes. Yeah, but you you knew that yeah. you are building something. Yes. And I think that's a conversation that we really need more of. Mm -hmm. How do you build sellable African businesses? So yeah. you yes, and yeah. and that means also that the way you're so systems. I was huge on systems and processes. Um, as I said, you know, I, I'm looking at the forms now. There are my forms. So eventually, when I sold, I sold to at the time I had um I was entertaining office offers from the largest player in it, the the Iron Mountain guys. Then in their spinoff subsidiary, um, the largest Africa wide player, who was listed in um in South Africa, uh, and, and then a French company, a French private company. And that's who I eventually sold to. Um, they also run a, a moving, uh, uh, a moving business. Uh, so the, the, 
Mobilitas, their their archive systems, um, but their moving company is oh my god, why it's just yeah gone. My perimenopause. Anyway, you sold to the French. So I sold to the French guys. And I sold to the French guys because the French guys actually gave me the best price. Okay. Also, um, the French guys understood. So we'd go to meetings and the other guys would not understand that I was the key player because I was a woman. You are you are a front. They are looking at you like, where is the... Where is... You, you can't be the person. You can't be the person. We have a mutual friend who I'll not mention on the podcast without her permission. <laughs> and she's just built her house. Mm-hmm. A really nice house in Vipingo uh-huh. after running her business, which she still runs for yes. 29 years. Mm-hmm. And everyone thinks she's a kept woman. She's like, who? who, who who's, no, whose now, house is this? You know what I say like, now? Who's nowadays? built for you the house? Yeah, yeah, nowadays I say, I want a sponsor like me. Because that's what they imagine you have a sponsor, right? So I keep saying, I want a sponsor like me. Um, but yeah, so, people just don't see you. So that you way. built a, you, 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 this is the journey that I admire. You conceptualize the business. You came, you actualized it, you built it. It was pulling teeth. It was yeah. painful. It was an emotional roller coaster. Your family paid a price. You personally yes. paid a price. Huge um, price. You have now sold it. Yes. You've gotten your check. And then what? And then I crashed. I had crashed. burnout. Yeah. I had burnout. Um, I needed to, I needed to just uh I needed almost two years to just recover from that. And I sold because I also didn't have the money to grow the business the way it needed to grow. If you had the money, would it still be open? Do you think I would, if I capital was not an issue? I would be a regional. I would have sold still because I was planning to sell anyway. But no, probably not sold. But yet. it would have been a regional business. I would have sold it for more money. Maybe I would have retained a minority share. So does it hurt you or does it pain you? Because we do know that there's uh, African capital available. There's capital in this market. Probably, yeah, mm-hmm. there's capital to the tune of what the French people paid you. Yes. But you didn't even have a local or a regional player or fund that could come and see and say and give you your fair value, yes. um, non-cash value, and say, listen, what if we were to fund this thing and you continue as CEO, yeah. but at market rate salary, yes. you know, and yeah. enjoy that. Yeah. So does that, does is there some pain there? There's still pain. There's still, still pain. pain. I mean, Particularly I still feel potential like I pain me. because yeah. you had the vision. Yeah. So you're now seeing, oh, this thing could have been. But I think that's, that's part of what you need to accept, especially if you want to be a serial entrepreneur. Um, that, you know, you win some, you lose some. Um, I think one of the reasons we're talking here is that we're hoping fewer and fewer African entrepreneurs are going to have to be making that decision. Yeah. Um, and hopefully the more African entrepreneurs that are around, the more we have, you know, angel investors who can maybe just get you to a little, just give you a little boost that we have more um, Africa centric funds, including Africa, I see committee members, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. With, That's a big one for yeah, me. With deep African knowledge, not just I'm an African, not a diaspora African. No offense. And and as a former diaspora person, there is a, a wealth of difference in terms of the the understanding of local context and local circumstance, you know, as I said. The understanding of and the placing of value. And the placing you of know, value. You know, I, I yeah. always say yes. Kenya is not aspiring or I view Kenyan entrepreneurship, not an aspiration to be a mini Europe yes. or a mini yeah. mini uh, uh, Asia, Latin America. This is Kenya. Yeah. And it has Kenyan nuances to it, yeah. Kenyan challenges, which you're going to have to learn. Yes. And, and, and uh, yeah. And they should come at a price. Like if you're going to learn them from me, I paid a price to learn them, right? Yes. So you should be prepared to pay that price for my knowledge. Um, and, and I think we also need to be prepared to demand a price. Maybe that's also how we need to change so, that. So you're now uh, Marilyn Kamuru, the serial entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, you continue to, you now angel invest, I know. Yeah. Um, and how's that journey going? And what are your big take-homes and what does the future look like for both yourself and for the African entrepreneurial landscape in your, in your opinion? I think it's um I think if we can have more honest conversations about the cost of entrepreneurship, including the personal and emotional cost, um I, I, there's absolutely no shame in you know stepping off of this roller coaster if it's starting to be too much for you. Take a break. Um, time take out. A, take yeah. a time out. Go get a job, or like I did, have a side hustle that helps finance some of the most difficult parts of that financially. 
Um, I think that's really important. Um, and it doesn't make you any less credible. Um, and maybe I just, I'm going to do a little small snippet and say there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a business person in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A business person is really just a trader. Some guy who's finding this thing at X and selling it at X plus, mm. right? Mm. Entrepreneurs create value. They innovate. Um, whether that innovation... They develop talent. They develop talent. They develop systems. They develop institutions because companies are institutions, right? It's not the size of the business that makes it an institution. It's whether it has systems and processes and whether it exists beyond just the the entrepreneur sort of um, ego, right? Yeah. Um, does it exist beyond just feeding me, mm. right? Um, so I think there is a lot of space for us. Um, I think that we need to have very serious discussions um, with, um, continue to have these discussions with government um, around policy because it, we can't continue, you know, succeeding despite. Um, so I, I have I have a take on that. Yeah. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to challenge the, what I call the African intellectuals, mm -hmm. because I think that there's a You're disconnect. I am. I okay. am. So okay. myself <laughs> challenge accepted, <laughs> okay, given by good. myself Thank and you. taken. So um, but here's what I think. I think that um, and you know this, uh, I know this might cause ruffle some feathers, mm -hmm. but I think we are an over corporatized market and what yes. i mean by that is that um the the african corporate has been placed placed on the pedestal yeah at the expense of the african entrepreneur yeah and i'm not saying it's a choice between one or the other yes. but i'm saying that this entrepreneur sees this thing differently yeah and because we have decades of experience of people who've walked a corporate journey retired uh, paid off the mortgage, then yes. that seems to be where we are pushing yep. everyone to go. Yet, the decisions are ultimately, even the policy decisions you want addressed, mm -hmm. are ultimately addressed by owners. Yes. Yeah? yeah. So this high-flying corporate who has to report to some shareholder out in South Africa or in Europe or in the States, ultimately is not the decision maker. No. And if you want to see Kenyan policy change, then Kenyan owners with the weight and clout have to sit at the table yeah. and demand that policy change that they want to see for the benefit of their market. Well, they have to, they have, I, I do think that they demand it. I think that there is a lack of respect again for the Kenyan entrepreneur, the indigenous Kenyan entrepreneur, in part because we tend to run smaller businesses. Yep. And so the, there seems to be, the, the value seems to be attached to the turnover when in actual fact, I actually think even from a risk standpoint, we're much more stable as a country with a solid SME base yep. rather than, you know, a handful of of large, you know, um, even if they're, you know, entrepreneurship based, not not straight up corporate, we're way better off building this very solid pyramid. I would argue that might actually be almost a bottom up approach, you know, like. You've gone there. No, I. <laughs> I've stopped. Okay. I've stopped. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, yeah. first of all, um, we've talked about this for years, and for you to finally be sitting here across from me as we do this first, do this first, first, first episode of our podcast. Thank you very much. Thank I you. think you have a phenomenal story. Um, I like the fact that you're you're telling it, and I think you should tell it more. I think um, um, it's very important for young women, young Kenyan women entrepreneurs to see themselves mm -hmm. and to know that um, there is pain, but there's also learning. Yeah. And, and young Kenyan men can also Yes, learn. yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay, saying. okay. I forgot you, I'm sitting with a feminist. <laughs> so young Kenyan men and yes, women, yes. you know, can can learn. Yeah. And I think uh, a, a dose of a bit more honesty and yeah. uh, vulnerability. Yes. Uh, you have not been afraid to say that there was a t price to pay. Yeah. So one, thank you very much uh, for joining us on African do yeah. yeah episode number one and um, look forward to I, I look forward to having you back again uh, should we continue we, we will yes as we continue yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah I am still a huge admirer of your journey and I can't wait to see what comes next as you uh, serial <laughs> entrepreneur and angel invest and continue champ championing the rights of women uh, in Africa and all over the world. So thank you very much. 
Thank you. Marilyn, and uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And I am really excited about how you're changing the way we see ourselves. Excellent. Thank and the you. world sees us. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, this is unprompted, but uh, just uh, celebrate uh, Sema Box and uh, Dan Aseda and his team. I think they are building another entrepreneurial yes. story. Uh, and uh, it's great that we can have this because we've been talking about this. <laughs> We're going to do it in my backyard. Yeah. We're going to do yep. it where I bought some mics, which I haven't used. So it's great to have a place like this where we can come, do this, and actually take it to the next level. So, yeah. Yeah. Kudos Thanks, to Dan. them. Yeah. yeah.